So the good news is the n plus 1 rule is pretty darn reliable, at least in OCHEM 2. <laughs> um, so it takes a while to sink in and be able to predict and understand splitting patterns, and you, I'm sure you have some questions by now. But um, there are some places where it's like, what's going on here? So let's look at that in some detail. All right, so the splitting splitting details are covered in your text, and we'll do some hardcore predicting of splitting patterns in class. But there are some important caveats to the n plus 1 rule. First of all, I focus on the next door neighbor because generally speaking, it, those are the only ones that are close enough to have an impact. Those are called vicinal neighbors the ones that are right next door, one, two. So generally speaking, you're only going to pay attention to the adjacent hydrogens. As I already alluded to in the first part of this mini lecture, part A, when hydrogens are next door to each other, but they're chemical shift equivalent, they're homotopic, uh, for some reason, you know, they don't couple. So when I have something like this, those two CH2 groups, well, I'm, you know, anybody in their right mind would be tempted to say, well, this guy has two neighbors, it should show up as a triplet, and this guy shows, looks like it has two neighbors, so it should show up as a triplet. And that would be wrong, because they're chemical shift equivalent. So the reality is this is one big fat singlet. Additionally, benzene. Well, honestly, don't we have hydrogens next door to each other in benzene? Of course we do, but they're all chemical shift equivalent. So the NMR spectrum for benzene is a singlet. Now, this is the really tricky bit. When we say the n plus 1 rule, you got to be really anal about what n means. n really truly means chemical shift equivalent nuclei, not just next door nuclei, they have to be chemically shift equivalent. So for example, if I want to focus in on what's the splitting pattern for that circled H? Well, the first thing I would do is I would look at this neighbor and this neighbor, and I'd say, whoa, there's four neighbors. Four plus one equals five. And that, strictly speaking, is W-R-O-N-G wrong because these two CH2s are not chemically shift equivalent. In other words, I have two sets of ends. That will split these two guys into a triplet, and this will split those guys into a triplet. So I don't have a pentet. I have n plus 1 here equals a triplet, and n plus 1 here equals a triplet. So what does it look like? Oh boy. Well, here's what it looks like. It looks like this. If I have a triplet, I can draw my triplet using a tree diagram like so. This indicates the splitting between H sub A and H sub B. Now, what about the coupling between H sub A and H sub C? Oh, H sub A and H sub C here. Well, then I'll draw my tree diagram again. That's all I have to do. So, and I know H sub C will split it into a triplet. So each one of these gets split into a triplet. And in theory, these guys are right on top of one another, as are these, as are these. So what does it look like? Well, at the end of the day, once I've drawn my two triplets, it should look like a 1 to 3 to 1, 2, 3, 4 to 3 to 1 pattern. And if you count, that's clearly a one, two, three, four, five pentet. Now, so what's the difference between two triplets and a pentet? 
Well, sometimes these don't line up perfectly. So you may have a an overlapping set of triplets that is just off a little bit. It looks like that. It's just so it gets kind of messy. So that's the reality of the n plus one rule. You have to pay attention to the nature of whether or not those neighbors are really chemical shift equivalent. And then the next caveat is the fact that exchangeable hydrogens, and exchangeable here in NMR speak, really are, we're talking about hydrogens on oxygen and nitrogen, they're easily exchanged between one another. So since we're usually talking about a bazillion molecules in an NMR tube, what this means is, hey, we've got some serious hydrogen bonding going on here. These two are kind of hydrogen bonded, so this is kind of not really there. That hydrogen is being exchanged between all kinds of molecules of methanol. So that means it's not on the oxygen long enough to actually couple. Hence, when you have a molecule like, well, we'll see an example in a minute, with an alcohol in it, it makes things a little less straightforward. Finally, N plus 1, as I alluded to, is extremely reliable, but only when the difference in the chemical shift, okay, so something like a, something that shows up at one part per million versus something that shows up at four part per million is really, really big, much, much bigger than the coupling constant. That's when you have N plus 1 splitting that looks like it should and that's called first order spectra. So let's look at a couple more examples. Does this molecule obey the n plus 1 rule? Well here is an example where the difference in the chemical shifts delta delta is really really small because all of these pretty much have the same chemical shift. You can see they're all way down here around 1. And so I don't have pretty little triplets and quartets and things like that. I have these hellacious looking multiplets. So n plus 1 goes out the window. There's nothing I can do with this particular analysis other than to say, hmm, there's blobs of signals down there. Those are called multiplets and they all seem to have pretty much, they must have pretty much the same chemical shift. All right, and that is because, as I, we've already said, you know, these hydrogens and these hydrogens, oh, shoot, and these hydrogens, they all, they're all too close to one another in terms of chemical shift. How about this one? Well, this is the exchangeable hydrogen example. This is the spectrum for ethanol, and if we're going to play the N plus 1 game, I would look right here and say, these guys have one neighbor. Well, they have, let, let, me, let me focus on the hydroxyl group. How many neighbors does the H on the oxygen have? Well, it has two. So this guy should show up as a triplet. And it doesn't. That's the OH right there. All right. This is the quartet at 3.6 or so. And this is the um, triplet down at 1. No splitting by the hydroxyl hydrogen because it's exchanging all the time. It's a singlet. All right, now, all these pretty patterns when we have n plus 1, as long as n plus 1 operates, we have one more piece of data to look at, and that is called the coupling constant, which is basically the gap that is between the patterns of your doublet, quartet, or triplet. So looking at this para-bromo um, ethylbenzene, <laughs> we have, let's just label these up, we have H sub A, H sub A, H sub B, H sub B, C, and D. Hmm, all right, how many neighbors does H sub A have? 
Well, h sub a has one neighbor. So h sub a should show up as a doublet. How many neighbors does h sub b have? One. h sub b should show up as a doublet. How many neighbors does h sub c have? Three. Should be a quartet. Should be a triplet. Now, looking at the actual spectrum, that's exactly what we see. And what this particular slide is showing you is that the gap between coupled protons must be identical. In other words, A is coupled to B and B is coupled to A. Therefore, that gap, the coupling constant, is the same for each of those patterns. We have two doublets, both of which have a J value of 8.5 hertz. For the ethyl and the ethyl group with its quartet and triplet, the CH2 is coupled to the CH3 and vice versa. Therefore, they are going to have the same coupling constant. And what you can see in this blown up spectrum is that that coupling constant, the J value, is 7.6 hertz for each. J values are characteristic. And so, if you look at the table 16.3 in CARDI, you will see that for our typical vicinal coupling, that 7.6 value fits right into the expected range of what we think the J value should be, around 7 to, 7 to 8 hertz. So this again is what we're typically looking at. But what I also want to focus on is the fact that there's lots of other kinds of spectra. And I mean coupling. And so I said it's usually just one, two. And this amplifies that. There could on occasion be coupling further away, but it's typically zero. Now look at this vicinal coupling around an alkene. That's pretty interesting that the ones when the hydrogens are cis is much smaller than the ones when the hydrogens are trans. That's pretty good news because that means proton NMR is going to allow us, just by looking at that gap, be able to tell, do I have a cis double bond or a trans double bond, or E or Z. That's great news. So that means that's why we need to be able to figure out coupling constants. All right, now this is pretty wild. I said we usually talk about neighboring hydrogens. Well, this one has hydrogens that are both on the same side, both bound to the same carbon. What's up with that? Well, what's up with that is if this is a bromine and this is a methyl group, then guess what? These are H sub A and H sub B. They are not chemical shift equivalent. They're in completely different electron environments. Therefore, they will split, they will couple one another to the tune of 1 to 3 hertz, which is a pretty tiny gap. Aldehydes, the aldehyde hydrogen can cap couple right next door, and then there can be long-range coupling. It's usually pretty small in aromatic systems, and that, uh, that can get kind of tricky. All right, so I do want to point out one more thing. This is a similar table from a different textbook, and I want to point out that this idea of coupling when the two hydrogens are on the same carbon that applies even when it's not an sp2 hybridized carbon. So what you can see here is an sp3 hybridized carbon. How can you possibly have chemical shift unequivalent hydrogens when they're both on the same carbon? One word. Stereochemistry. So if you look at um, that, this is called geminal coupling. And if you look at this next example, and of course this is far more complex than anything you'll ever see in this class, this is a fancy schmancy molecule that has a stereo center right here. So that means that these two hydrogens are not in the same chemical shift equivalent environment. They are not chemical shift equivalent. This is H sub A and this is H sub B. Because say, if this one is up, 
and H sub B is up, H sub B feels a different effective magnetic field than H sub A. And that is why when we start looking at the spectrum of this molecule, we have a much more complicated spectrum than we might think we do if that stereo center was not present. But as a nice reminder, when the NMR gets complicated, the IR stays simple. And it tells you the important things you need to know, like, oh yeah, got a good old OH here. Oh, looks to me like I got a carbonyl. Mm, wonderful stuff. Don't forget your, your IR. All right, so that wraps it up for coupling. That's the good news. The further good news is that if you take the train cross country, um, such as maybe this one's crossing Upper Plains on the way to Washington or something, the Empire Builder, but oh, you know what happens when the engine breaks down? Well, if the engine breaks down, it's no big deal. And this happened, of course, and the engineer um, conductor let the passengers know that no big deal. The engine, one engine is broken down, but there was another one, and they were going along and shoot. The second engine gave out. So the engine, I mean, the whole train stopped, and so the engineer let the passengers know that the second engine had stopped, had failed, and he, so he said, ladies and gentlemen, I have some good news and some bad news. The bad news is that both engines are now down and we're stuck here until help comes. But the good news is you decided to take the train and not fly, which is really looking on the positive side of things, don't you think? So we will do lots of examples in class, and that is where I will see you next.